Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 2020 Virtual Forum for Excellence Conference and welcome to breakout session one today. Um, we are so excited for you to be joining us today um, and we're so happy um, that you could attend this breakout session. Um, this breakout session is with Josh Davies um, and he will be speaking with us today about 2030, the virtual world. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. As a reminder, all participants on this call are on listen-only mode, which means you are muted. Um, and we will preface you um, by asking you to post any chats or comments or questions within the Whova chat. Specifically the Whova chat, you will see that the Zoom chat is disabled. Um, so we ask that you post those in the Whova chat and we will be conversing with you live as the session goes on, as well as we will do a Q&A at the end with Josh. Um, this session will be recorded and it will be posted to our website um, after the forum is over. Uh, we will also have the presentation slides as well available with that recording. And then following um, the conference, these materials will be posted on our Forum for Excellence website, um, as well as the Hoover chat as well. Um, and so I would like to introduce Josh Davies to us today. Um, he is presenting this presentation, 2030, the workplace evolution, um, and we're listening to it in the virtual world. Um, and I am your moderator today and tech support for this session, as well as my colleague, Anita Kerr. Um, and my name is Kirsten Bayer with the Illinois Center for Specialized Professional Support. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Josh, if you would like to share your screen, Josh. Absolutely. Absolutely, Kirsten. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for participating and engaging uh, in today's virtual session. I know um, in the perfect world, we'd all be here face to face. We'd get a chance to interact with each other. We get a chance to see each other. Um, but in today's world, this is as good as we're going to get. And so I'm excited that you are all going to join me virtually as we talk about the future of work. So uh, as you're all out there across the state doing what you do, um, let me just introduce you briefly to who we are. Um, we are the Center for Work Ethic Development. We're a national organization and we partner with folks all over the country, more than 750 different organizations. Um, a lot of those are in adult education, uh, post-secondary ed, community colleges, commu tech colleges, uh, secondary education, workforce, nonprofits, uh, anyone and everyone who's doing workforce education across America. Obviously, we know that the partnership between adult education and workforce really came to a head with the forced marriage in WIOA. But I've loved the embrace that adult educators have had across the country as we move beyond simply helping folks get those high school equivalencies, get the reading comprehension, get all those scores up, but also then help prepare them for the future of work. Because we know education with workforce creates sustainable lifelong change. The challenge with that is how do we adapt because change is happening so rapidly, right? We've seen things just sort of blow up, not just this year, which has been certainly one for the records, but really over the last 10, 20 years, the pace of change has never been faster. In fact, it's estimated that 85% of the jobs that are gonna be done in 2030 haven't even been invented yet. I mean, how crazy is that to think about, right? 85% of the jobs that are out there haven't been invented. So how do we prepare our students how do we prepare all these folks for jobs that we don't even know if they exist? And what do we do about the jobs that are going away? Well, it's important before we start just freaking out about what the future has in store for us to take a look at some of the key elements that are driving what we have. Because everybody talks about jobs going away and jobs disappearing and robots taking over. But the reality is there's a key concept to know when it comes to technology called creative disruption. Because robots and all these sort of things that people are talking about. It's just technological changes. They're not new. Technology isn't like something we just created. There have been scores of different technological improvements over time that have indeed, yes, gotten rid of jobs. But the idea behind creative disruption is that technology creates more jobs than it gets rid of, right? I mean, if you just look like telecommunications, for instance, right? Sure. For a long time, switchboard operators were a critical part of that, right? but nobody today is training folks for a switchboard operator position. No one's hiring for switchboard operators. Instead, we've evolved and now technology has us developing mobile apps for our handheld telephones. Right? Technology comes, it takes away some jobs, but it creates thousands others. 
right? When you look over time in America, the number of jobs gets impacted by larger economic factors like recessions, not by technology. Overall, the number of jobs just continues to grow and grow and grow. What happens with technology is where those jobs are gets adjusted, right? If you go back to 1850, 150 years ago, well, here's what you'd see is that nearly 50% of all the jobs in America involved farming, some sort of agriculture, being out on a farm somewhere, right? 50%, half of our workforce. Today, that's less than 2%. What's happened? It's not that those people are unemployed and not doing anything. We've shifted those jobs primarily to white collar and service jobs. Seriously, there's some blue collar jobs in there too, but it's just kind of where the job distribution happens. I mean, a perfect example is the personal computer, right? The personal computer came around and yeah, it got rid of jobs. It estimated that almost 3.5 million jobs were destroyed by the personal computer, but it created over 19 million jobs, a net gain of almost a little over 15 million jobs or 10% of the workforce, right? Sure, technology gets rid of some jobs, but it creates new ones. And that's kind of the key thing to keep in mind as we talk about sort of this doom and gloom future that's ahead of us, right? Because the problem isn't that technology takes jobs. The problem is when technology would take your job, right? That's really the, the key thing, right? How do you react to that? How do we help prepare folks if their jobs are going away or the jobs are currently working in? There's different approaches. One of the worst approaches is simply to bury your head in the sands or as the Luddites did in the 18th century in the United Kingdom, right? They were textile workers. What they did was kind of natural reaction. People came and a factory got established in their town that was going to replace their jobs with these automatic looms. These automatic looms were amazing because they could do the work of 20 textile workers with just one person. It was going to revolutionize the entire economy of the city. But the problem was it was also going to put 19 out of 20 of these men out of work. So what did they do? Did they go to their local community college to go get retrained? Did they try and develop some new skills? Did they get their high school equivalents? No, of course, they didn't do any of those things. What did they do? They snuck in the middle of the night and they smashed all of the machines with their hammers. They thought that's how it was going to save their jobs. But the problem with that is it doesn't work. That's not a long-term strategy, right? Because technology is like toothpaste. You can't get it back into the tube. What you have to do instead is focus on how it is that you can adapt and change. And it doesn't matter whether or not you're a textile worker in the 1800s or a mega national corporation. If you don't adapt and change, you're doomed. I mean, let me give you a perfect example. A little company known as Kodak. I don't know if you remember Kodak. I certainly do. For many of us, right, a Kodak camera was a rite of passage, right? It was just something you got, right? When you're like 12 years old, you just got your own camera. There were cameras, cameras, cameras everywhere. And in fact, Kodak drove the camera market. Over 85% of the market share of, Kodak, of cameras in 1975 were Kodak cameras. Nearly nine out of every 10 cameras purchased were Kodak cameras. But what's interesting about Kodak's business model is that Kodak virtually made no money on cameras. They weren't trying to. It was a lost leader for them. They were trying to get as many cameras into as many people's hands as possible because where Kodak made all their money was to selling what? Yeah, film. Kodak made money developing film, processing film, and when people purchased film. That's where they made almost all of their money. And the reason why it was so popular for them to do, because they had a 90% market share of film. In 1975, they virtually owned a monopoly on the American film and camera market. They were destined for greatness. This company was unstoppable. 1975 is also a critical year because that's the year that Kodak, well, at least an engineer at Kodak, finally got a meeting with the CEO. This engineer, had been working for a pro on this project for a long time and finally got the meeting with the CEO and dropped this big bulky machine on his desk and said, sir, this is the future of photography. Well, the, the CEO of Kodak was more than a little surprised because they'd been trying to make their cameras smaller and smaller and easier and easier and portable. And this thing was anything but, right? It's big, it's bulky, it's ugly. Like, what is it, he asked. This, sir, is the world's first filmless camera. The CEO was confused. He said, yeah, yeah, it doesn't put images on film. Instead, it stores them on this cassette over here. Because remember, this is 1975. We don't even have disk drives. The cassette is the best we have. But it digitally stores them on the cassette. The cassette then can upload them to a machine, and that machine can then print 
those photographs, those photographs. And then the tape can be reused time and time again. What do you suppose the CEO's reaction of Kodak, a company with 90% market share of film where it makes all of its money, thought about the first filmless camera? <laughs> of course, it's like, get rid of this thing. I don't want to have anything to do with it. And he made it go away. The reason I point that out is that in 1975, Kodak had the opportunity to patent digital photography. But because they didn't want to change, they didn't want to adapt, they didn't want to evolve, they said, make it go away. So how does that work out for Kodak? Well, in the short term, it's just fine, right? You can see this share price actually in the late 90s goes way up, almost $100 per share. But by 2012, the company is bankrupt because digital photography comes and takes over. Now, Kodak isn't the only company in America or the world that hasn't adapted, right? When you look at it, almost 52% of the Fortune 500 have gone extinct over the last 15 years. I mean, that's a staggering failure rate. But it's not because they weren't good products or companies to begin with. It's because they didn't adapt and evolve. I mean, Kodak's a perfect example for me because they have a flip side. They have a sister company called Fujifilm. Fujifilm was basically the Kodak of Japan. The difference was they didn't have the opportunity to patent digital photography. No, they had to figure out something else. And so what they decided to do was to evolve. They merged with Xerox, a document duplication company. Because really what photography is about is about image duplication. And so they realized it was all about duplication, 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 and it diversified what they did. And as a result, once the storm hit and in those mid 2000s, we see the huge decline in the sale of film. What happens? Fuji has diversified and is able to stay alive. Kodak goes out of business. So if you want to go to your local Walmart or CVS and grab yourself a some film for your old camera you found in grandma's garage, you can do that. But you can only buy Fuji film because that's all that's left. Now, the challenge with all of this is that we have to decide. Do we want to stick to our guns and do what we've done and be Kodak? Or do we want to evolve and change and deal with the change and grow from it? Well, as comfortable it is to keep doing what we've always been doing, the reality is we all know this. If we want to be successful, if we want to adapt to this changing world that's ahead of us, if we want to be prepared for 2030, we can't be the Kodaks and keep relying on what we used to do. We have to become the Fuji films of our area. And in order to do that, we have to understand more about what's happened in the past and what this means for the future. So let's take a look at what's happened throughout the history of America as it relates to technology, because there's some important things that we need to know about our past before we look into our future. First of all, there's three key concepts about technology, because technology is linear, right? It just keeps happening. There's not like all of a sudden technology hits. No, technology is constantly coming. It's constantly coming at us. One key concept to know about technology is that computers and technology are going to get faster. They have been. Um, this is a concept known as Moore's Law. Moore's Law is mildly complicated, but in essence, it says this. Every 18 months, the power of a computer or the speed of a computer, if you will, will double. Every 18 months, it doubles, it doubles, it doubles. And those blue little diamonds you see there, those are simply charts along the way to show you how quickly it happens. And it follows that sort of, sort of little pattern right there. And you can see this, it's been happening for over 115 years, now over 120 years, right? We've seen that just the power of computing doubles about every 18 months. Now, in addition to that, one of the things that also happens is that computing gets smaller and smaller and smaller. This picture is very interesting. You can see there's this sort of goldy little minor thing down here. That's actually the world's smallest computer. This big white thing right here, that's the head of a grain of rice. Yeah, that's how small these computers are getting nowadays. Just tiny. And at the same time, they're getting faster, they're getting smaller. What they're also getting is cheaper, right? It's just amazing how much more inexpensive things are, right? If you took the computing power of an iPad 2 and you purchased it in the 1960s, it would cost you over $10 billion. I mean, that's just a staggering amount. So it's getting faster, it's getting smaller, and it's getting cheaper. And at the same time, as these things happen in this continuum, they reach certain tipping points. Now, tipping points are important here because what happens is technology eventually starts to change the nature of work. Or as economists call it, it's a decoupling. 
It's where two factors that were always together, two things that, you know, if there was a rise in X, there would be a rise in Y. These things would continue to happen. But what happens is technology comes around at some point and breaks that up. And a rise in X no longer causes a rise in Y. And there are certain times in American technological history that these are really critical. The three times we found through our research, first, are 1940s. In the early 1940s, what ends up happening is we take technology from the wartime movement, World War II, and bring it into the civilian world, specifically around automation, mass production. We put them into American factories. And what we find is it changes and revolutionizes the math and the economics of working in a factory. Because up until that point, if you wanted to produce more cars or razor blades or whatever it is, you'd hire more people. You would invest your, cap, your money into labor. What ends up happening is that instead, if you want to improve output, you invest in capital, you invest in technology, you invest in these other things. And as a result, productivity goes up. And so we're producing more, but we're doing it with fewer people. In fact, what you can see there is the decoupling between productivity and labor. And what we've seen since the late 1940s is a decline in the total percentage of people in manufacturing jobs. But at the same time, people working in manufacturing continues to go down, 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 and down. The number of outputs, that is the production value, continues to go up, 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 and up. You may not know this from listening to the news, but we are producing more manufactured goods in America than we ever have in the history of our country. We're just doing it with fewer people. And that's a result of the decoupling of 1940. The next decoupling happens in 1970. 1970 is where we really start to move computers into the workplace. And this almost has the same impact on the white collar workforce that the mechanization, the automation, and the mass production had in the blue collar workforce in the 1940s. Why? Because now we can have lower skilled people producing higher skilled output, right? You don't need to have a doctorate in mathematics. You can have a computer do a lot of that work for you. And what has this caused? A de decoupling between the wages that we have to pay and the output. Because now, as I said before, computers can do the thinking and produce highly skilled output with a relatively low skilled person. As a result, since the 1970s, what have we seen? Productivity continues to rise per hour as computers get faster and smarter and cheaper, right? All the things we talked about. But hourly compensation, which was once perfectly linked productivity, has since flattened out because we no longer have to pay people a higher amount to get higher output because we're paying more for computers and the capital to do it. The 2000s are the next time we saw a huge technological shift. Why? Not because it's necessarily investing in capital at one location, but because of the investment in capital in the World Wide Web. With the World Wide Web truly in this idea of broadband, we now really got rid of this whole idea of location. Before, if you wanted to do work, you needed to be at a physical office, right? You needed to go somewhere and do something. But more and more, people are able to work anywhere, anytime. As a result, what ends up happening is their productivity goes up because we're now not limited to being in the office from eight to five or whatever that used to be, right? We're now working anywhere, anytime. People, right, for most of us, right, what's the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning? Right, we're checking our phones. Before you go to bed, we're checking phones. On the weekends, we're sending emails. On vacations, we're going online and just checking a couple things real quick, right? We are working everywhere all the time. Now, the challenge is the Bureau of Labor Statistics only tracks hours worked in terms of a traditional 40-hour work week. We're working more hours than ever, but they're not being recorded because we're not in the office. As a result, you see the decoupling between productivity and the hours that are being worked. There are these three fundamental shifts are really critical because these decouplings change the environmental nature of work. They change the economics of everything. And what's also interesting, when you look at the dates, 1940s, 1970, 2000s, they seem to happen about every 30 years, meaning the next decoupling is going to be in 2030. That same time frame we talked about at the beginning, right, where 85% of the jobs are going to be brand new. I don't think that's a coincidence. So let's take a look at what's going to be happening that's going to be shaping the next 10 years so that we can get a better sense of how we can prepare for this uncertain future. Now, again, nobody out here is going to be able to tell you exactly what the next 10 years have in store. 
frankly, we have learned, if anything, this year that we don't know anything about what the future has in store exactly. Nobody in January of this year would tell you exactly that this is what we would be doing in September of this year. No one. So what we have to do instead is make conjecture. We have to see what's influencing us and see what we can kind of pull out from that. If you paid any attention to this discussion around what people call the future of work, you'll know that there are really two waves that are coming at us at the same time, two things that are influencing us. Number one is automation and this idea of robotics or robots and computers kind of doing more things for us. Um, it, you know, a lot of people talk about industrial robots, right? That are coming in and they're doing all these different things. And then industrial robots are increasing at about 15 to 20% per year. That's great. But the growth in automation isn't happening in our industry. It's not in advanced manufacturing. The major place we're seeing a significant growth in automation is in non-industrial uses, right? When you look at it, that industrial percentage, insignificant compared to those red bars where we're getting over, right, $25 billion in new robots, worldwide by the year 2022, right? It's going to be huge. So where are all these non-industrial robots? They're in our homes, right? More and more of us, right? We used to think that we had a robot in our house because we're thinking about like the robot from the Jetsons. The reality is almost all of us have robots in our house. And we don't even know it, right? Our smart speakers, those are robots, right? The ring doorbell, that's a robot, Right, of course, the Roomba, we know that is, right? But oftentimes our refrigerators, our products, like everything about us, not even counting our phones, are filled with automation and robotics. So we're gonna have more and more robots and automation in every aspect of our life. That's gonna be one of the growing trends by 2030. And at the same time, we're gonna have increases in artificial intelligence. Now, artificial intelligence is one of those things that people talk about like, oh, um, we're gonna have these you know, robots and these, uh, no, okay. What artificial intelligence is telling us is that computers are going to get smarter. And this is just like Moore's law, right? We said Moore's law is going to get us to the point where things are getting faster, right? About doubling every 18 months. And eventually computers will process things at the speed of certain brains, right? There will be a point where it'll process things at the speed of an insect brain, process things at the speed of a mouse brain. Or if you extrapolate Moore's law out to 2030, you'll see that we'll be processing things about the speed of a human brain. So by 2030, automation will be everywhere. There'll be computers in everything we do, and they'll be able to think at the same speed that we do. That's going to be huge. Now, I know what some of you are thinking right now, right? There's like robots everywhere, and they'll be thinking like humans. You're like, oh my goodness, the Terminator is a documentary. Holy crap, we've got to go find Sarah Connor. Okay. Um, the Terminator is not actually a documentary, just so you know, but it does have profound impacts on how we do what we do and what impact it's going to have on the world. So when these two waves are coming in 2030, we don't know exactly what it has in store, but we have a pretty good idea that these two things are going to come together and cause the next decoupling of 2030. And it's going to have an impact in a lot of different places too. One of the things to know about 2030 though is that 2030 has been radically influenced by 2020. Now, I don't mean that 2020 has changed anything. No, 2020, more than anything else, is speeding things up. When you take a look at what I think 2030 is going to have in store, it's going to have four major impacts, all of which have been sped up as a result of the, what's happened this year. Number one, there will be a permanent elimination of jobs. That is just what's going to happen. Second of all, employment and how we work is going to be redefined. Third, there'll be business consolidation that will speed and continue, and that will have profound impacts on every aspect of our life. And most importantly for us in our world, there's going to be a significant disruption around post-secondary education. As I said before, 2020 hasn't changed any of those things. But what 2020 has done is it's been like this guy throwing gasoline on a lit fire. It has blown things up. It has accelerated at the pace of change. And you can see already some of the things that we've been talking about for the last couple of years as it relates to the future of work, you can see how they've already come into focus through the work of 2020. So let's start with the first one, this whole idea of the permanent elimination of jobs. Unless you've been under a rock, you know this, right? There have been millions of new people who have been laid off of work. Um, despite our sort of declines, we're still averaging around 800 to 1 million, 800,000 to 1 million people being laid off or at least filing new unemployment complaints every single month. Since 2016, what's happened is we are now at a net loss of almost 13 million jobs. 
And the scary part is the jobs we're losing are not created equally, right? Most of the jobs that were being lost are in low wage professions, some middle, some higher wage professions. And certain industries are getting hit even harder than others, food and drink, retail, travel, tourism, right? These jobs are losing tens of millions of jobs. And almost all of the jobs they're losing are low wage jobs. But the really depressing part about all this is not that we're losing jobs, but here's the reality. The University of Chicago estimates this, right? Almost a little over 40% of the jobs that we're losing will never come back. That's a little over 13 million jobs that will be permanently lost. Now, the scary part about that, right, is we talk about what, what, what do we mean by permanently? Those are not coming back. Why? Because more often than not, they're going to be replaced by technology. We're going to find new ways of doing things. We're just not going to need to bring those people back. And really, this points me to what I think is going to be the decoupling of 2030. The decoupling of 2030, I believe, is this, is that creative disruption is going to go away. Well, not exactly go away, but creative disruption is going to happen. It will simply be creating fewer jobs than technology gets rid of. For the first time ever, we will be eliminating faster the number of jobs from technology than we will be creating them. And that's going to have a profound impact on our communities, the work that we do in particular. I, I, let me put this in perspective. I, I think that there is kind of a canary in the coal mine. If you want to look at one sector of the economy that's already had this happen and has really gotten sped up by 2020, I want to point it out. It is the retail sector. Retail is really a bellwether of what we're looking at when it comes to the removal of creative disruption. Why? Because it's been here hiding in plain sight. Because oftentimes retail is one of those things that people look at simply at top line numbers and don't really look at what's happening on the ground. What do I mean? If you look at retail sales in America, retail sales in America have been slowly growing every single year at about a 3% clip every single year. That's pr pretty decent growth. People look at that and like, oh yeah, Things are going really well, but not all retail growth is created equal. For a lot of folks, what we're finding is that it's almost entirely growth in e-commerce channels. Now, that's not necessarily just through Amazon, but that's also through, you know, walmart.com and those things. The physical department stores where you go in, whether or not that's a, you know, a Macy's or whether or not that's just your local bricks and mortar store, those sales have been slowly declining ever since the early 2000s. And when you look at the impact overall that we've had as a result of the recession in 2030 and 2020, what we've seen is that while retail sales are down about 10% across the board, they're up over 15% in online channels. So what's happening? Stores are going out of business. About stores have always gone out of business. The difference is we're seeing for the first time more stores are closing than they're opening. And this started around 2017. By 2019, it hit a brand new level of Armageddon, right? More than 16 national retailers declared bankruptcy in just 2019, led by Payless Shoe Source that closed 2,500 stores. That is a brand new record, right? 16 national retailers closed just in one year. Well, 2020, an attempt to prevent anyone else from thinking it was not the worst year possible, we've already had 26 national retailers declare bankruptcy this year, including Neiman Marcus, Lord & Taylor, the oldest department store in America, right? It's estimated that we have over 10,000 national retail stores that have already closed just through mid-July. By the end of the year, it's estimated we're going to go closer to 25,000. Wow. UBS, um, it's a national organization that, uh, you know, it's an investment firm that tracks these kind of things. Last year estimated that we'd have about 75,000 stores nationwide closed by 2026. They had to revise those numbers just this year. They have increased it by more than 25%, going from 75,000 to 100,000, and decreased the year by one to 2025. We're seeing a huge shift, 100,000 retail stores and all the people who work in them. And this is a problem because when you look at the number one job held in 42 of the 50 states, it's a retail clerk, including right here in Illinois. And if you look at just Illinois, there are over 1.2 million direct retail workers across the state. And if you look at the numbers, over a quarter of them have lost their jobs just this year alone. And the reason why, to me, retail is so scary is because there are not only 
more retail employers than there are in any other sector in the state of Illinois. But these are people who oftentimes have no transferable technical skills, right? There's no upskilling. There's nothing to do. And it's dominated by people oftentimes who may not have a high school diploma, may have some English language literacy issues, right? The people we're already attempting to serve. Now, you look at the number of people that are going to be out of work, needing to get skilled, needing to get education, needing to get training, that number is going to explode. And we're going to be that line of defense. We are going to be the ones who are going to have to help these folks. And we're going to have to start now um, because that is a lot of people and we are not equipped currently to be able to handle it. Hey, happy Thursday, everybody. Great to have you here on this conference. I know uh, you were expecting for something really uplifting. I think maybe you came to the wrong workshop. But let's talk about some of the other things that we're talking about influencing us over the next 10 years. The next is this. The whole nature of employment and what we mean by employment is going to be shifting. It already has been, right? This idea that, you know, you just work for a company has been long dead, right? There was a time, maybe our parents, our grandparents era, where you work for one company for your entire life, right? You get the Rolex at the end and you retire, right? That went out. of All right. And then there's a generation that worked multiple companies, right? You're doing the same thing, but after 10 years, you'd move to another job. You'd move to another job. Then there was a time where you'd have a career for a while and then you'd switch careers and we'd have a multiple career journey. Then we got to the point where we're just kind of shifting and doing everything and working anywhere we want to. We're going to get to a whole new place in this new gig world where employment is totally changed. And it, again, these are not new things. They've been happening for a while. The idea that a traditional nine to five job is what people are working has been declining over the last 20 years. Even during the Great Recession, what we saw was that the growth in employment was in part-time or temporary positions, not in full-time employment. That just wasn't happening. In fact, if you look at non-traditional employment, right, uh, freelancing, contract work, those kinds of things, it more than doubled between 1995 and 2015. Those kinds of jobs were just changing. More and more companies were saying that we didn't want full-time employments and full-time employees and all the stuff that went with it. We instead wanted to find somebody to work on a project basis or a contract basis. And this is only going to speed up. It's estimated that almost a third of all organizations that have laid off full-time employees during this 2020 pandemic are not going to replace those positions with more full-time people. They're going to hire contract people. They're going to go part-time. They're going to do something different. Why? Because they've realized they don't have to have physical people in the office anymore, right? It's estimated that more than six out of every 10 workers worked remotely during some point of the COVID-19 crisis. For us as educators, almost all of us had to do something where we moved into an online virtual space. And that's not unusual for us. But again, like many things, what this has helped expose during the pandemic is that it's not created equally. All right? People with a bachelor's degree or higher, almost two-thirds of them were able to work remotely. If you had a high school diploma or equivalency, maybe a quarter of you, if you didn't even have a high school degree, only about 10% of you were able to work remotely. So this idea of remote work isn't something that is equal across the board. And unfortunately for a lot of the people that we serve and we work with, right, we know this, they're unable to take their current jobs and work remotely because it's just the very nature of their work. They need to get educated in order to get the jobs that will make them successful. We've got to help them do that because if not, what's going to end up happening is they're going to end up in this gig economy. And a lot of folks are there already, right, where the gig economy is going to say this, you're not going to be able to work for one company more, you're going to have to sort of gig yourself out, whether or not that's to Uber or WAG or, you know, any one of these different ones. And what happens when people can't work remotely and have to do this gig economy, right, which we've seen a huge growth of it, is it changes the dynamic. It changes the relationship because you're no longer an employee. You're now an independent contractor. And what that means is that you get to set your own hours, get to do your own thing. That's great, right? Even as a contract worker, you get to work on cool projects and stuff, but that's all well and good until you get sick. Who pays for sick leave if you have sick leave? Vacation? Who pays into a 401k or retirement or a pension plan, right? What about healthcare, right? We know healthcare has been linked to employment for far too long. Or continued job training, right? Who takes care of all the things that are normally part of our employee-employer relationship? With the nature of employment changing and this idea of becoming more virtual in what we do, the reality is we still have to take care of the things that we know are tied to employment. And without employers doing that, we're going to have to rework the social safety net to take care of some of these. 
Oh, what's the next thing that's going to happen? Well, we're going to have improved, uh, increased business consolidation. More and more businesses are going to be consolidating. What does that mean? Well, we already see this, right? Um, for those of you who watch TV and media, you know you see these all the time, right? What's happening? Fewer and fewer decisions are being controlled. More and more decisions are being controlled by fewer and fewer companies. If you turn on TV, you'd swear there were millions of things to watch. But the reality is that 90% of what we watch on TV is controlled by six major companies. To put in perspective, that same 90% was controlled by 50 companies in 1983. If you turn on the TV, you'd see this, right? And some people know that, but if you go to the grocery store, it's even worse. Or you think about all the brands that are out there in the world. The reality is we may think we have a host of choices, but the reality is almost every single global brand is owned by one of 10 mega brands, Kraft, Coke, PepsiCo, General Mills, Kellogg's, Mars, Unilever, Johnson, Johnson, Procter Gamble, or Nestle. These companies are driving everything. And they're not alone. What's happened over the last several years, ever since the big tax break of 2017, more and more companies have kept more and more of their earnings. And what they've done, very few have invested in their workers. Most have invested it in purchasing up rivals and others, right? Some of the most famous ones of these, right? Or Facebook goes and buys Instagram, for instance. Um, more recently, where Walmart goes and buys TikTok, right? What do they have to do with it's about expanding distribution because at the end of the day, we're moving to a model where instead of consumers buying from a business, we're going directly to the source, right? We're going to an amazon.com, right? We don't really care about the brands anymore. We're going more to a B2C model instead of a B2B model. And as a result, distribution channels in particular, online channels are going to become more powerful and more important than ever. And these are the companies that are swallowing everyone else up like an Amazon that purchases Whole Foods. What do I see? I see a future where, in essence, uh, basically every distribution decision gets controlled by one of three primary mega companies. Walmart, Amazon, and a little company out of China called Alibaba. And the scary part is 2020, again, has accelerated this pace. Why? When you look at valuations of these companies, and then as a result, they're buying power for other companies. The overall Dow is down year over year. Eh, it's not quite as bad as it once was, but it's still below where it was a year ago. On the other hand, Amazon is up over 40%. Walmart's up almost 10%. And the US-based version of Alibaba is up over 30%. The rich keep getting richer, and then they're going to buy out the smaller ones and will soon control everything. Great. <laughs> well, what's left? Hey, how about secondary education? Post-secondary education in particular has been on a really dangerous path in this country for about the last 20 years. And 2020 has only really exposed the fault lines that we already have. And we see this in particular with our four-year brothers and sisters. A lot of those institutions have not been adapting. Why? Because it was for a long time that a bachelor's degree was your ticket to the middle class. Right? Getting a baccalaureate degree, no matter what it was, was your guarantee that you could be successful. And we saw earnings for a lifetime continue to rise up until the mid-2000s when it started to stagnate. At the same time, we saw the stagnating value of a degree. The support of post-secondary education from our states has been significantly declining. This chart shows over the last 10 years, all the states that have decreased their funding for post-secondary education. While not at the bottom and certainly not at the top, Illinois is right there in the middle, right? Declining just like everybody else. So what ends up happening? Students have to spend more money. As students spend more money, what happens is we shift the burden. Just 20 years ago, if you wanted to go get a degree at a post-secondary state institution, you'd pay for only about a third of that and the state would pay for two thirds. In 20 years, that's entirely shifted. You now pay for a third, two thirds, and the state only pays for one third. At the same time, state public institutions are raising their tuition, room, board, all the rest of the fees, everything. And then private institutions match that because they want to be seen as also just as valuable and maybe even a little bit more. So, what happens? We see spiraling inflation in the post secondary world. The cost of getting a degree continues to go up, 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 and up value of that degree remains virtually flat. So what ends up happening? We see more and more students collecting more and more debt. Now about $1.5 billion, a trillion dollars in student debt. So what happens? The value proposition just isn't there. More and more students are saying, I don't want to go to a traditional four-year university. I don't want to go to college anymore. In fact, you see why people don't go to college. It's not because they can't get in. It's because they can't afford it. At the same time, you're saying this file finding this whole thing where it relates to cost and that seed, you're also finding that fewer and fewer students are available to go to college 
because the demographic shift to Generation Z after the millennials, there's just fewer college age traditional students. And what that means is these schools aren't getting the students that they once had. And their entire business model is based on seat time. Well, that becomes a problem, especially when people don't feel that they're getting an education because they're not getting in a seat, they're doing it virtually. As a result of the pandemic, on-campus enroll enrollments for both returning and new students are down about 15% for the semester, an estimated $23 billion impact on educational institutions. Worse yet, the incoming class, the ones that are right there, about 40% are choosing not to go to class at all. Why? Because they want an in-person experience. The problem is that more and more of these students are unlikely to actually end up going to college next year, disproportionately impacting our Black and Latinx students. But the real long-term impact is going to be not only on our students, but on the institutions themselves. It's estimated when you look at the economic cost that a lot of schools that were already teetering on the brink are going to be in danger. Right? Three different scenarios here. We're in the middle one right now. We're going to be online until probably January 2021 at most of our institutions. That means that 66% of our private not-for-profit schools that are four-year schools are in some sort of economic danger. The good news is that next column over, our public less than two-year or two-year, you know, our community colleges, our technical colleges, a lot of the programs that we're associated with, they're the most financially stable. But the reality is this is going to have a huge impact, massive on the number of students because what's going to happen is schools are going to close. A lot of institutions are in very, very sad shape. 345 private colleges around the country are at risk of shutting their doors within the next six years, many of them within the next two because they just were not prepared for this. And the impact that has is not just on the schools, but on the students who were in them, who are, again, are more likely than not, not to continue their education. And we have to figure out a way to help take care of those students. Not to say anything about these small towns oftentimes that house these schools and the economies of those towns that are driven almost entirely on having these students in. It's going to be a terrible place. Oh, wow. Happy Thursday to all of us, right? What are we going to do? We're going to have massive unemployment because the problem is we're going to disrupt this whole idea of creative disruption. We are going to have employment as we know it and the relationship between employer and employer changing dramatically. We're going to have mass consolidation, everything controlled by three global mega brands and post-secondary education. It's going to be shook up and completely destroy the fabric of where we know today. Well, if you're anything like me about this point in the presentation, you're thinking to yourself, oh my goodness, I don't want to be around till 2030, right? This is absolutely crazy. But what I'd like you all to do right now is I'd like you to look at the screen. I'd like you to put your hand up just like me, put it here up to your screens and do me a favor. Take your thumb and your forefinger, make a little thing like this. Just repeat after me. Say, though the future is scary, I refuse to be scared. Instead, I will get prepared because it's channeling that inner Boy Scout, that inner Girl Scout that's going to help us get to where we need to go. I want to share with you now four steps that you can take, th four things that you can do to better prepare yourself for the coming evolution. Four things you can do for yourself, your students, your program that will get them prepared so that we can get there because the reality is this, we have 10 years. We've got a runway. We've got time in order to make this happen, but we have to be diligent about it. We have to be prepared. We can't stick our head in the sand. If we want to be the next Fuji instead of the next Kodak, we need to make changes starting today. So let's start with the very first thing that you can do. You can stop repeating repetitive reiterations. What? And long story short, just stop doing things the same over and over again, because we don't know what the future is going to have in store in terms of jobs. We know this jobs that are repetitive are the ones that AI and automation are most likely to take away. If it can be done over and over again, regardless of whether or not it's manual or cognitive, it will be. We've seen this since the Great Recession. And in fact, if you go back 30 years, almost 90% of all the job losses over the last 30 years have been in repetitive jobs. That's important to know because when we look towards the future, what we have to do is figure out which jobs are most likely to not be replaced by machines and focus on developing our students and putting them in pathways to get into those careers. A perfect example, if you look at this, this shows different career fields and the percentage of that job growth that's in things that are repetitive or non-repetitive. Look at the bottom two, the two with the most growth. They're not created equal though. 
construction, heavy growth, but almost all of that bar is purple and blue. Purple and blue, if you look down, are routine, man manual, and cognitive tasks. Those are going to be replaced by robots. So that little gold bar, that's all the growth that is non-repetitive, and that's virtually nothing. On the other hand, you look right below it to health, healthcare and social assistance careers. Those jobs, almost all of that bar is red and gold. Those are jobs that are non-replaceable, right? Those are non-repetitive tasks. Those are great career fields. So when you look at what's out there, be thinking about what are the kind of jobs that are non-replaceable, right? Education and training, gold and red, right? Heavy in those spaces, right? Mining, yeah, maybe there's a lot of jobs there, but those are all going to be able to be replaced, right? Manufacturing, significantly purple and blue. Be focusing on the careers and jobs that we know won't be replaced. Stop repeating repetitive reiterations. At the same time, one of the things that you want to do is develop folks, high touch skills. High touch skills are important because there are two things. They're non-replaceable, right? Human beings have certain inherent characteristics, things they can do that cannot be replaced by a computer, right? I mean, think about this. Um, telemedicine is great, right? Because one of the problems we have is problems with doctors in rural areas all over Illinois, right? You can't find necessarily doctors who want to move to some of these different communities. They as a result, hospitals are closing down or they're not having the same services. So what do we do? We do telemedicine where we can Skype and do different things. We'll have wearable devices that will be able to track our blood pressure and do all these different diagnostics. It will be fantastic. It'd be a great way for people to get healthcare no matter where they live in our communities. But at the same time, do you really want a terminal diagnostic given to you by this doctor? No, right? We want someone with empathy, somebody who cares. Those are human high touch skills that no one else can replace. Right? How do we connect with people? Those are the skills we need to be intentional about developing. And great companies already today understand that. One of the best technology companies that's out there also happens to be one of the best retailers. That's Apple, right? Because if you go into an Apple store, what I love about it is a technology company. You go into their stores, what is it all about? People, right? There's very few products that are out there. It's almost entirely filled with people. That's what Apple is all about. It's about connecting with the human element. They've even got genius bars to help you have human-to-human -human contact to explain the technology. You flip that around with something like a Best Buy store, right, that's floated with nothing but product. What we've realized during this pandemic time, and especially with the growth of online shopping, is that a store like this just becomes a commodity. If there's no one there to help, and there oftentimes isn't, right? I can do better by finding reviews online, by looking and finding what I need, by asking my friends, by doing all sorts of different places and, and comparing price. There's no reason for me to go in these big box stores anymore because there's no human element. Everything I need, I can get online. We understand that the human component is going to be driving the success of our students. More importantly, when you look at the most valuable skills in the future, they're going to be things that robots can't do, specifically creative thinking, uh, critical thinking, and problem solving. Those two skills are going to be the hardest to find and the most essential in the future. What's interesting, if you go down that lower box from there, the essential skills, but relatively easier to find, the next line of essential skills are, again, very high touch, oral communication, organization, teamwork, ability to work with diversity. You go to the far upper right hand, right, the least essential skills. Those are where you see the technology skills. That's where you see STEM skills, those kinds of things. That's the kind of stuff that computers will be able to do. We're already seeing the impact of this. When you look at it, Right? Critical thinking is a great example. Just over the last three years, you've seen a growth of about 158% in jobs requiring critical thinking. And entry-level jobs for our students who do then graduate, who do get those high school equivalencies, and they get those jobs requiring critical thinking, pay almost an average of $9,000 more annually. That's significant. And once students get hired, once our students get those jobs, they can keep them longer if they have those human skills. Harvard University did a study over 100 years ago, Stanford University backed it up recently, found that 85% of our success in this world was about people skills, about connecting. All right, we need that top, we need those technical skills at the top, or we need that high school equivalency, we need those English language skills to get that job. But once we do, it's how we relate to people, that's what makes us successful. And we know this is true no matter what career you go in. The third step that we really wanna take a look at is this idea of apprenticeship and evolving apprenticeship. Because when we look at it, it's gonna be even more important in the future for two reasons. Number one, we already know that people don't wanna get an education beyond high school because they can't afford it. We know this already, right? The adults who are in our classrooms have a hard time balancing the realities of work, 
family, transportation, that only gets worse if we have to go to higher ed and it becomes more expensive. What happens in an apprenticeship is you work and you earn at the same time, right? This earn and learn model is powerful because it allows people to expand their careers, get education, and be successful at work. But it's also become very important because entry-level jobs, that first rung in the ladder, are going to be going away. And when those go away, what ends up happening is that nobody can get into our career field. We'll still need people the second, third, and fourth rungs, but there's no way to get started without these apprenticeship programs. And as a result, what we've seen is an emphasis, a growing number of apprentices in America. This has been one of the points of emphasis of this administration. You've seen a growth overall in the number of apprentices nationwide. But the problem is we're focusing on apprentices in the places they already are for the most part, right? And where are they? Overwhelmingly, the construction trades and manufacturing, which is great for those two fields, but we know already those are the jobs that are more likely to be going away, right? Those are the automated tasks. When you look at those growth areas, information technology, healthcare, those are a fraction right now of the apprentices in America. We need to shift our focus and really try and figure out how to get more and more of our students, more and more of our employers in our local community invested in apprentices in different fields, non-traditional apprenticeship models. That's powerful. But we also have to do a better job of getting people excited about it. And that starts again, whether it's in our high schools, in our adult ed programs, we have to educate and market to them. Because right now, the people who go into these programs are not reflecting the diversity that we need. Right? Almost 93% of all apprentices are men. Seven out of 10, quite honestly, are white. These don't reflect the diversity of our workforce and don't certainly reflect the diversity of our future workforce. If you want to get some more resources on how you can help your local community, whether or not that's through your own program, through your community college, through your local employers, a great organization that's out there is called CareerWise. CareerWise helps make it things easier for different organizations, in particular for employers, to help partner with local educators to figure out how to create a model that works. They don't reinvent the wheel to give you a model that you can replicate to help create some more of these non-traditional hyper-local apprenticeship models. The final thing I really want to put an emphasis around is how do we do a better job of not relying just on degrees, but also doing more and more focus around the skills necessary. Our community college partners have been great at starting this off, this whole growth around the certification movement, where it doesn't have to necessarily be an AAS degree or a four-year degree but we can quantify some skills early on because what we found is that skills matching, that is matching the skills an employee has versus the skills an employer needs is the best way to ensure future success. The problem is we have often assumed or used degrees as a proxy. The reality is that a degree itself is a terrible proxy for the skills necessary. Just because two people have the same degree from the same institution doesn't mean that they have the same skills. What we have to do is figure out how to quantify skills that are part of that and be as intentional about that as everything else because that's where success happens. A perfect example, um, there's this advanced manufacturing facility in Kentucky um, and they found they had the CNC machine, this massive machine, super fancy piece of equipment. Well, the person who was operating it retired and so they went to try and find people in this town who could help replace them. Well, the problem is they followed the same process they always had. They needed someone with at least three years of experience, a two-year degree, and the industry, in this case, a NIMS certification. Well, the problem was they couldn't find anybody. For over a year, this machine sat idle because they couldn't find anybody to operate that particular machine. So they hired an HR consultant to come in and say, hey, what can you do? Can you help us out? And they did a task analysis and found that, yes, they could find somebody to work this machine, but the three things they needed to have was someone who was had fine motor skills, attention to detail, and the ability to switch tasks frequently because those were the three most in-demand skills for this particular piece of equipment. So they went through the town, tried to find somebody with those three skills, and they found somebody. They took a chance and they hired him. This person was not somebody from the factory. They were a sushi chef. <laughs> yeah, the sushi chef who had fine motor skills, attention to detail, and the ability to switch tasks frequently. They took a chance, hired that sushi chef, and now that sushi chef is the top trainer on that CNC machine. More and more skills-based hiring and moving towards non-traditional hiring methods is going to help people, especially in this post-2020 world where we've got so many people who are unemployed from different careers who need to switch careers, who need to switch jobs. Identifying the skills that they developed will help them and help employers find the perfect workforce for the future. 
An organization, again, that's out there helping, if you want to get some resources, is called Skillful. Skillful is a nonprofit initiative that's a combination between the Merkel Foundation and LinkedIn. It's helping employers around the country make more skills-based hiring and shift in that process. Look, the future is uncertain. We know that. It's scary. But we can evolve. We can get prepared. If we stop repeating repetitive reiterations, if we focus on developing high-touch skills, if we evolve the apprenticeship programs in our communities, and we focus not just on degrees but also on skills, we can be prepared for this evolution. We know 2020 is going to be here. We know it is going to be radically different. 2020 has shown us the light that things will change. They will change quickly, but we have time to adapt. But what we have to do is get prepared, is to take this opportunity to look at our programs, to look at what we're teaching, to look at the students in our community and figure out how it is we can better prepare them. Because if we don't, we're simply going to be the next Kodak, all out of business. Instead, I challenge you to evolve, to think outside the box, to become the next Fuji film of the future, and you have the chance to do it. Thank you for being part of my virtual conference. I'm going to open it up to some questions now. Um, I know, Anita, you've been sort of watching the chat area. I don't know. We don't have a ton of time for some more questions, but I'll take them. Also, if you want to tweet uh, anything you saw or anything about this, you can do that at results driver. I will also put my email in the chat window here, um, it is J Davies, D A V I E S, at workethic.org. All right. Um, Anita, do you have any questions already teed up here? I don't know how we want to make this work. We, we did have uh, one person kind of asking you to clarify about if so much of job success is about the people. And yet we know there's this AI push coming. Can you just kind of explain the way that um, that works? Again, it's about people skills, right? What we know artificial intelligence won't be able to do is it won't be able to problem solve or do the critical thinking. And it won't be able to have the empathy that we relate to as humans, right? We've gotten really good at chat bots and even at doing, you know, the phone trees. But almost all of us, right? When you're calling up, one of those 800 numbers, right? No matter how good it is, you don't want to sit there being like, no, yes, right? Almost all of us, were hitting zero. We're like, agent, 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 right? We want to talk to a human being because we don't like dealing with computers, right? What we need to realize is that no one does, no matter what field you're in. So we have to develop the people skills because eventually we will be replaced if all we're doing is the same task over. The people skills, will be more powerful than artificial intelligence because the people skills will be what differentiate us and separate us and the computers can't replace. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Josh. Um, we don't have any more questions coming through, but if you do have any final remarks for Josh, you can go ahead and contact him um, via his email. And then just to close us out, I just want to thank you for your attendance today. Thank you for your presentation, Josh. We really do appreciate um, your expertise and your presentation was great. I know I enjoyed watching it. Um, and Josh will be presenting at the next session too. So if you know of anyone who you want to kind of tell to watch this this presentation um, for our breakout session too. If you have a colleague that you think would really enjoy this that didn't attend um, this session, Josh will be presenting again at 1.15. Um, and I did want to ask you all to go ahead and rate this session. I apologize that um, this picture might be a little blurry on your screen, um, but you can rate this session um, after the session exits out right here on this rate session button and you can do that for all your sessions today as well as go ahead and follow us on our social media um, we have the adult education illinois professional network center social media um, the illinois center for professional support social media and the illinois community college board as well um, go ahead and use these hashtags too if you're tweeting out from your personal social media, the Forum for Excellence 2020 and Excellence for Equity. If you tweet anything at Josh, that way everyone can know you attended the forum today and you heard him at the forum. Um, we also wanna ask you to engage with us for our photo mosaic wall. Go ahead and text in your live photo and this will stream live um, tomorrow between 8.30 and 12.30. You can watch all your photos come together. Um, a great fun interaction. 
um, to engage with us today at the forum. And then again, we just want to thank our sponsors um, for putting on the forum today. We would not be able to produce this conference without them. And then again, thank you so much, Josh. And we will see you all at 115 for breakout session two. Enjoy your lunch. Awesome. Josh, did you have anything? I just want to say to this, and I, tr I tried to tell everybody this year, as you do everything you do, three things to keep in mind. Stay strong, stay healthy, and stay positive. If you do those three things, we will make it through 2020 with no problem. Great. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy your lunch. Bye, everybody.